Good evening. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the 10th Goldstein Lecture. And uh, we're absolutely thrilled uh, to see all of you here this evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm John Oxendorf. I teach in uh, both architecture and civil engineering here at MIT. And it's been a real honor for me to work closely with the Goldstein family over, I believe, about the last eight lectures in, uh, in selecting and bringing distinguished uh, thinkers and designers and researchers from around the world to come and share their work. And I would like to invite Roger and Eli Goldstein up to say a few words about the lecture. And I believe Roger will begin. So please join me in welcoming Roger and Eli. Thanks, John. It's really weird with a handheld mic. Well, it's great to have such a big audience, and uh, I appreciate all of your all of you coming out tonight. Uh, as John mentioned, this is the tenth lecture. I'm going to give you the uh, what we refer to as the creation myth. Um, how is it that this lecture came about? In uh, 2006, um, uh, my father Jim uh, was turning 80, and my brother Eli and our other brother Ray, who is in Cambridge, England, um, decided that we wanted to honor his 80th birthday by doing something that would recognize the fact that he was uh, a very loyal MIT alumnus and an architect and engineer. And uh, since I'm an architect, Eli's an architect, and Ray is a scientist, we decided to make this uh, lecture uh, be focused on the intersection of architecture, engineering, and science. So we called it the Goldstein Lecture in Architecture, Engineering, and Science. What a funny name. Um, the idea was that uh, we would find, each year, we would find a, a person, uh, a practitioner, an academic, uh, ideally somebody who's involved in in uh, applications as well as theory, and uh, bring that uh, person who fit those descriptions, whose interests lay at the intersection of architecture, engineering, and science, in order to expose the students here in, um, in architecture specifically to a broader range of influences than uh, just uh, what historically has often been um, mostly other architects coming to speak to architecture students. And this has been a really, really fun experience, and we've found some tremendous uh, lecturers over the years, and I'm just going to read the list. I have not committed it to memory, but some of these names you will recognize. Uh, Cecil Belmond, Werner Sobeck, David Mackay, Jamie Carpenter, Guy Nordenson, Janine Benyus, Matthias Kohler, Shigeru Ban, and last year was Paul Linden, and we're very excited that Jane Wernick is here to give our 10th lecture, and uh, just can't wait to hear what she has to say. But first, I'm gonna pass this to my brother. Say a few more words. Thank you, Roger. Good evening, everybody. Uh, during my introduction to last year's lecture, I noted that roughly one third of our Roughly one-third of our nine speakers up to that point were architects, one-third were engineers, and one-third were scientists. I'm sure John will tell me if there was a conscious effort on that part, but I don't think so to split it evenly, but that's how it turned out. And, uh, and that was a happy coincidence, given that the underlying objective for the lecture was to foster a dialogue across these disciplines. In the decades since the first lecture, there's been an explosion in new technology which has reshaped the world of professional practice. In last year's introduction, I wrote, quote, one common thread that has run through these lectures has been the integration of thought and action, of thinking and doing, of mind and hand, unquote. In rereading that line this morning, I realized that that only told part of the story. The rest is that our tools from virtual assistants to virtual reality headsets have accelerated the trend toward what some people call disintermediation, in which, uh, in other words, that they've drastically simplified and accelerated the process of translating ideas into actions. In light of the above, 
this, the centennial of the Institute's move to Cambridge, which, which Professor Oxendorf is leading this week, seems like an appropriate time to consider rethinking the phrase mind and hand. Perhaps without realizing it, each of our lecturers in their own way and through their own work has shown both the importance of mind and hand, but also the degree to which they can no longer be considered separate concepts or endeavors. I would not presume to know what to call the, this continuum of uh, both these concepts, but I do know that our speakers have convinced me that that is where they belong. So we hope that you enjoy tonight's program, and I'll turn it back over to John. Thank you very much, Roger and Eli, and all the members of the Goldstein family who are here. And uh, I should say you're all alums of MIT as well, and so welcome, welcome back. Um, well, it's a real delight to introduce Jane Wernick, one of the world's leading structural engineers. And although in the previous nine lectures we've had three engineers, three architects, and three scientists, I'm pleased to introduce the tiebreaker, which is a <laughs> structural engineer. And uh, Jane is someone whose work I've, I've admired for many years from afar. And she's an extremely accomplished engineer who has built uh, award-winning projects around the world. Beginning with her career uh, at Arup, she opened the Los Angeles office at Arup. She did a number of important projects with Arup, and including the uh, initial design for the Millennium Wheel in London, the, the London Eye, and then set up her own firm uh, in uh, 1998, Jane Wernick Associates, which quickly became very well known around the world, and she's going to share her work this evening, and I have to say that among her many honors and awards, and, and she has a long list of letters after her name, and including letters like CBE, which are very significant for, uh, for many of us, um, she says that her work is, is about uh, creating delight and happiness. So uh, to, to um, in particular, she, she authored a book and helped co-edit a book called Building Happiness, Architecture to Make You Smile. And she was incredibly generous with her time this morning, spending an hour and a half with students uh, here talking about how design can, can really uh, lift the human spirit and the potential for, for design to change and improve the world. So please join me in welcoming Jane Wernick for the 10th Goldstein Lecture. Well, good evening, and thank you very much for your generous introductions and for inviting me to be here um, and to contribute to this rather daunting series of talks. <laughs> so, um, commodity, firmness, and delight. I'm sure that most of you know that these are the words that, in his 1624 work, The Elements of Architecture, Sir Henry Wooten came up with these to translate the words that Vitruvius had written in his De Architecture Libri Decem, the 10 books on architecture. Over the years, both architects and engineers have referred to these qualities and argued about their re relevance or even the accuracy of the translation. Well, my own view is that they are um, quite a good general summation of what we try to achieve when we develop projects for our built environment. We want them to perform well, to be durable and reliable, of course. But if, in addition, they can also bring delight, then they can really be considered to be successful. Increasingly, it has become obvious to me that in order to achieve this, we, who are involved in the projects, have to be good collaborators. Without doubt, the most successful projects that I have worked on have resulted from the best collaborations between client, stakeholders, all the members of the design teams, and the builders. When I think about collaboration, I think about exchanging ideas with like-minded people, where we both respect and trust each other, and with whom I share some common goals. Inevitably, the process of collaboration will also include a shared sense of humour. So I thought I would talk to you about a number of projects that I've been involved with and say a bit about the way in which the ideas emerged and were developed. So 
So I'm starting um, with this photo. This is of the Kenwood Ladies Pond in London's large natural-ish um, park called Hampstead Heath, where I swim two or three times a week throughout the year. Because it's one of those places where I can both practice mindfulness, where I concentrate totally on the moment and the sensations of swimming, surrounded by nature, and where I also sometimes experience a state of what some psychologists call flow, a kind of complete absorption. It's a bit like the feeling that we get on the best projects, where everything comes together. The client, design team and contractor truly act as one. Of course, this happens rather rarely, but if we can savour those moments, learn to recognise them even, I'm sure they gradually infect the way we work and interact with others. So as John mentioned, um, I have become interested in the topic of happiness. You may have heard that in 1972, the King of Bhutan said we should measure the success of a society as much by measuring the gross na national happiness, the GNH of the nation, as much as by measuring the gross domestic product, or GDP. And the Swiss economists Bruno Frey and Alois Stutzer have been writing about what economists could learn from happiness research since the late 1990s. I was a member of a think tank at the Royal Institute of British Architects, REBA, called Building Futures. And we were generally looking at what might be happening in the built environment in 20 to 50 years' time. So I proposed the topic of building happiness, that is, how does or how can the way in which we design our built environment affect our psyche? After arranging a seminar and a debate on the subject, we decided that the subject was broad enough to justify a book, which I edited. It's really a collection of essays by practitioners and researchers in the built environment, as well as some short pieces by well-known people about places that really do give delight. I think this book shows that there are many ways of thinking about the effects of what we can construct um, and, and, and um, how, um, uh, how, how, how that the, those effects can or um, may affect our ability to feel happy or equally sad or miserable or uncomfortable. Um, and at the same time, a number of consistent threads emerged. People are happier if they feel engaged with how their local community is run. And if the way in which we design their physical space encourages this, then so much the better. How we feel about a place is, of course, affected by many things. As the landscape architect Martha Schwartz says, although a visit to the Grand Canyon is thrilling, her childhood memories mean that her backyard rates as higher as a happy place. There are benefits to being generous in the design of spaces that allow for social interactions. Students suffer if their rooms open onto long, closed corridors. It matters if strangers can walk past your bedroom window. So a lot of these things are kind of common sense. And of course, <clears throat> the physical conditions of daylight, warmth and noise all play a part. As it becomes more obvious that increasing GDP will inevitably lead to more consumption of our planet's scarce resources, it's surely imperative that we concentrate more on how the way in which we design our built environment impacts on our emotional well-being. In the following projects, I will describe how we, together with the clients and architects, did our best to develop solutions that would bring a smile to those who will experience them. And I'll try to describe the collaborative process that led to the evolution of those projects. I'm actually going to start way back in my career. This is um, a project called Kokomas, and these models were made by Fry Otto. Uh, so a year after I graduated, I was very fortunate to be moved to a group that was working on a large project that was going to be the, um, the government buildings in Saudi Arabia. And Fry Otto was the consultant architect for some, a series of special structures, and these are chain net models. So when they're hanging upside down, all the elements are in tension, but if you can imagine it frozen and turned the other way up, like the bottom left, then theoretically, just under its own weight, all the elements would be in pure compression. In fact, some of the structures were quite flat, 
And we found that when we actually did the computer analysis on these, that the axial shortening you get distorts the geometry such that you do actually get secondary bending. So it's, it, I always feel that this is a catalyst for an idea to produce a rather beautiful form, but it's not pure. And the other thing is, of course, that a, any building or structure is never going to just experience one load case in its lifetime. So this is just for its own self-weight. But imagine when the wind is blowing, all sorts of other effects are going to come into play. Now, I was the baby of the group working on these, and there were um, some fantastic analysts like uh, Joachim Schock, um, who was involved. And the other thing that had happened was that Ted Happold had just left the group, taking a third of this project. And um, it was shortly after the completion of Centre Pompidou. And Peter Rice had left Arabs to set up a firm with Renzo Piano called Piano and Rice. But Fry Otto said he wouldn't work with Arup on these structures unless Peter was involved. And for me, this was very fortunate because Peter, therefore, was a consultant to our group and I got to know him and, and I'm very fortunate that he became a mentor. And one of the um, next projects that we worked on, actually still at the same time as Kokomas, was this study of the Fiat car, uh, which Renzo Piano had brought to Peter. And the idea was that... Um, that we would go back to the idea of the, the chassis as opposed to the monocoque. So in these days, so this is late 70s, early 80s, to do the um, computer analysis of, of a monocoque car would take days and days and days um, of a very huge computer. Whereas the idea was that if we just use stick elements, we, uh, we could analyse it much more quickly. Also, the, the idea was that the, the frame would be made out of steel and you could concentrate your corrosion protection on those elements. And then the skin of the car would be made out of um, a structural moulding compound and you could change the colour of your panels or if you got into a prang, you could replace a bit. And so uh, we analysed this um, car and we had to... This is, this is a graph that shows the length bet along here between the front and back wheels and up here is the torsional stiffness of the car so um, this was one of the parameters that we had to meet and this is showing the weights of different um, uh, all sorts of different cars and we had to make sure that we were under this this line for our car once we um, had put in the steel that we needed for it and um, the idea was that it, that that, that um, frame would be made out of steel pressings, one millimetre thick, which would be joined together um, with with these little welded um, spots. And this is one of the drawings that I did to show how the pieces could be fitted together. And we were trying to make sure that we were representing the stiffness of these of these pressings. These they were basically square hollow sections that we were making accurately in the stick elements that we put into our simple computer model. And then this is a drawing of the pressings of the whole thing that would be put together. Uh, another model that shows where the seams would be. And they actually made a full size um, model of this and then they tested it for that particular load case. This is the only time in my life that I have worked on the analysis of a structure and it has been tested for, and, and we've known how it responded to a particular load case. So when we design buildings, I feel we're operating in a parallel universe. So we set up a whole series of load cases. We say, right, what's the maximum live load that could be on every floor? Let's imagine everyone's standing to one side. Let's imagine we've got maximum wind. We don't know whether the building will ever see that combination of load cases, and even if it did, we don't know how it's really responded. We just know that, by and large, if we construct in our minds this mental model and then we replicate it with our computer models, that, by and large, buildings are performing OK. But it really kind of brought home to me what an inexact science engineering is. Now, um, this is still when I was at Arabs. I was, um, again, lucky that um, P Peter Rice formed another company. He was very entrepreneurial, RFR, with Martin Francis and Ian Ritchie. 
and they did this competition um, for Parc de la Villette. So this was a huge building that was built in, in Paris in, um, at La Villette. And it was a bit of a scandal. It was built in the 70s to be a kind of massive abattoir, the idea that everyone would bring their livestock from all over France. And of course, that was a ridiculous idea. Why not just kill the animals on the farms and then put the meat into refrigerated lorries? So the, it didn't work as an abattoir. And it's then so the idea was to turn it into a museum of science and industry. And, and I'm sure it's mostly Peter came up with the idea of the structure of this. So it's a, it's a very interesting structure, and it spawned this way of supporting glass through bolt holes, which is the precursor to the Pilkington planar glazing system. So um, just to describe it briefly, there's, there are these vertical columns, and there are eight meter centers, and they support horizontal beams, also eight meter centers, and each beam has four pieces of glass hanging from it, two meters by two meters square. Now between the, piece, the seams between the pieces of glass, there's a small cable truss and which resists the wind loads. And behind the big beams, there's a bigger cable truss that stops the whole frame distorting. The next slide shows that a bit more clearly. So this is the cable truss that's behind the seams between the pieces of glass. So when the wind blows in, this inner cable takes the tension. When you get suctions, that cable takes the tension. Now a cable truss is a very light looking stru uh, structure, but it does deflect a lot. So we, had th th we found that this node would move in and out by up to 75 millimeters. That's three inches under extreme wind loads. And this, and this is only eight metres apart, so that's a very high deflection. So we were worried that as this would happen, we would put large bending into the glass. So the, so the critical thing is that this is showing there's a bolt that goes through the glass, but it actually, it's th through here, but it's actually going through a little spherical bearing. So it's like as close as you could get to an idealised pin. So that as the glass moves in and out, the, um, the, the, bolt, the bolt doesn't restrain it and put more bending into it. But there are, of course, high stresses on the, on the hole around the glass, just due to the weight. And so to make the glass able to carry that, it's pre-stressed, it's toughened. So what they do is they take a piece of glass, heat it up, and then quickly shrink the outside of the glass by blowing cold air on it. And that makes the inside of the glass go into pre-compression. And you know that that glass is strong, but you've all seen, I'm sure, car window screens that when, when, it, when if you pop the surface, it breaks into little dice-sized pieces. So that meant you had to drill the holes in the glass before you did the toughening process. Now, this is one of uh, Mitterrand's Grand Projet. So it, there was a lot of money that went into research, and Saint-Gobain, the glass manufacturer, did a lot of research to make sure that they understood what the distortions would be during the toughening process to make sure that the holes would end up in the right place afterwards. Uh, now, what I think is very interesting about this glass facade is it looks very, very light. Um, but if you, but notice we do have these big columns and beams. And I once did an exercise. I don't know if you know Stansted Airport, but that's got glass walls and that's got steel mullions behind it, and it looks quite heavy. But actually, if you take the whole area and divide up how much of it is opaque compared to this, this is more opaque, but it's all concentrated in a few elements. So I think it's really important that we as structural engineers learn to look very critically at what we're drawing on the page and really understand what things look like. And it's not good enough for an engineer just to make sure things are strong enough and stiff enough. So that was talking about Peter and his collaborations, and I think they led to some extraordinary things. Um, I was quite fortunate that when I was at Arabs, I was working on a project with Fosters, which didn't get built, but it was going to be the headquarters of the BBC uh, radio headquarters on the Langham Hotel site. And Julia Barfield was working um, at Fosters then, and her husband, David Marks, was working at... Rogers, in fact, at the time, on the Lloyds building. And they asked me to uh, collaborate with them on, on an architectural competition, actually, for a, a project in Trafalgar Square called Grand Buildings. So it's the first time that I, myself, as opposed to being 
you know, 17 layers down, uh, was working on a competition with an architect. And we used to meet on a Saturday morning at their house. And um, we didn't win, but uh, we did get our entry published as TMX, which was fun. And then, um, then I went to Los Angeles, as John has mentioned, and I got a fax from, from them saying, would I like to collaborate with them on this uh, competition, the Institution of Civil Engineers launch, which is an uh, ideas competition for a bridge of the future. So they were in London, I was in LA, and um, um, we had the idea to, um, to um, use um, um, as our model what Darcy Thompson talked about as the animal, as the quadrupedal bridge. So the, it's the animal that spans between his front and back legs. Um, there's a slight diagram of it here. And your bones take compression, and it's the tendons that, that control the deflections. So uh, because of where we were, I said, let's put it over the Grand Canyon, and it's fixed at this end. And then at this end, it's only supported vertically. It's just a pedestrian bridge, no cars or anything. So, and then the idea is that this, this, this kind of nose could slide sideways as the loading changed on it. Because I just love those primitive kind of rope bridges that move as you walk along it. So that was the inspiration behind this. Um, and we did actually win this, and this, and this was again a good collaboration. We'd back, back and forward these kind of sketches between us by fax in those days. And then when I got back to London, um, I collaborated with them again on this project, which is a water sports activity centre in, in Liverpool in one of the docks, the Prince's Dock. And it's... Um, we actually thought... It, well, the budget was a million pounds, and which was quite a low budget even then. It was something like £300 a square metre to build it. And we, we looked at the idea of just buying a massive barge, but that turned out to be much more expensive. So there are actually there are piles that support um, this deck, which is made out of precast concrete beams with a, um, an in situ topping. And the idea is that the columns are set in from the edge at the lower level, and then they splay out to to support the perimeter of the building at the top level. So here, um, you could pull in the, um, the windsurfs or the canoes or whatever. And then at the top, there's the, the, the dry level. And it was a very simple building with, so it's just, it's just got these columns that splay out. The, the one luxury we decided was to have a casting here and a little casting there at the end. Uh, but um, we, di we didn't mind having big columns at the bottom because they're a bit like the massive bollards that the big ships are tied to. And then these frames, they, they're, they're like portal frames at the top, and then we're using the walls of the building inside to provide longitudinal stability. And then years later, I got a phone call. Would I like to go and have a chat with them about another ideas competition, a landmark for the millennium, that the Sunday Times newspaper and the Architecture Foundation would launch? And David had had the idea to build the world's largest observation wheel. At the time, the tallest one was in Yokohama, which at 100 metres diameter. And Julia had spotted this site beside County Hall and behind the Shell Centre. And David said, let's go for 150 metres diameter. So it would definitely uh, win. Um, and this, this site was interesting because the, the walkway beside the river has to be kept clear. So I said well, we don't want to put a leg in the river, so we'll have to cantilever it. So that made it an unusual wheel. But the other thing was that I would think they, you know, they wanted it to be a wheel of the 21st century, so they didn't really want anything between the spindle and the rim. Um, so we tried the next best thing, which was just to have one stiff arm. So it's true you've got a, a big half circle of just clear air. So this was our competition entry. Nobody actually um, won this competition, sadly, but David's late father was quite entrepreneurial and said, well, if you could get someone to fund it, it will pay for itself eventually. And so they got the local London paper, the Evening Standard, to run a Back the Wheel campaign, and they looked for people to, to fund the studies. Um, by chance, met Bob Ayling, who was then the chief executive of British Airways, who said, oh, this would be a great British Airways Millennium project. So we then got paid some money to, to develop the design and try and get planning permission, which was always going to be a long shot. Now this, although it's got this big 
gap with no structure in it, you can see that the rim looks very, very heavy. Oops, wrong one. So this is the structural diagram, but it means that the rim has to span all the way around, and, and also it means that this arm has to be very, very thick. So we asked David if we couldn't possibly look at another alternative, which is the bicycle wheel. Now the bicycle wheel is a really magical structure. It's a tensegrity structure. The compression element in the middle doesn't touch the compression rim. Uh, but the other thing is that um, the weight comes down through the spindle and it would tend to make the wheel go into a horizontal oval. And it's actually the horizontal spokes that are carrying your vertical weight. So I think it's a really clever structure. I mean, also, it's this slight angle here that enables it to resist some horizontal forces. Well, our wheel is different in that our load is it's supported, not, not down here, it's supported at the spindle, and all the load is coming on from the rim. So there's a tendency for this to go into more of a vertical oval. And so by pre-stressing the, the cables, we stop that happening so it stays circular. And the other thing is that when the wind blows, um, the... the the leeward cables would tend to go slack, and we wouldn't want that to happen, otherwise the whole thing would collapse. So we pre-stress them against that. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, and, um, of course, when you pre-stress all the cables, what you do is you put the rim into compression, and things that go into compression have a tendency to buckle. And so the primary load case that we really had to consider was to make sure that we made... We had came up with a structure that was stiff enough to resist buckling, uh, but wasn't so heavy that we had to put in more structure to resist buckling. And you can imagine, a, oh, oh, the puns, it was terrible. <laughs> but um, you can imagine a wheel buckles, the first mode is when you've got like two quarters going towards you and two away from you. That was the critical one we had. To, so um, the way we did it was, A, we have a triangular truss for the rim, and then uh, and we we played around with the size of that truss to optimise it and also to optimise the length of the spindle so that the angle for the wind load was optimised. And then also we have these other um, cables which instead of just being radial from the centre go to the sides of the rim. So they provide a bit of kind of torsional resistance as well. I'm just going to skip through these but because I could just talk about the wheel. But it was, so Arabs took the design up until tender. It had to be a design and build project because British Airways didn't want to fund it themselves. They wanted a bank to fund it. And so that meant that we weren't involved in it once um, it was tendered. In fact, the tender was won by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries who then tried to dumb it down. And so they got sacked and it be went, became a con um, construction management contract. Anyway, this is it being lifted up. Now, obviously, when it's being lifted, the load case on it's completely different from when it's vertical. And so there are a lot of temporary cables. That are, that these ones are going from the spindle, top of the spindle to the rim. So that's enabled it to... So that you can see they, when it's being lifted, this is pushing up on the spindle, which then puts all of those cables into tension. So it's picking up the wheel uniformly rather than just trying to pick it up from one point. So it was pulled up, and then off, and, it, and the, at this stage, the wheel is clamped to the same angle that the inclined A-frame is at. And then a week later, they pull down the back of the spindle, so that went horizontal, and the wheel went vertical. You can see it's lifted up without the capsules on it. The capsules came down by river. It was very important that the glass is doubly curved. I mean, the whole process of getting planning permission was another story in itself, but it was really important that it looked beautiful um, and that it wasn't equated with a fairground ride. And the other thing I didn't mention is that the capsules are on the outside. They don't dangle within the, the, the rim uh, so that when you're on top, you can look all around. And that was one of the very first ideas we had. And so in, in here, there's, um, there's um, like a, a toothed wheel and there are, um, and that's um, on the inside, and the floor it sits on little wheels in, in inside that tooth wheel. So the little wheels are turned all the time to keep the floor horizontal, because we had lots of worries like would would a rugby team get in and try and jump on one side so that the floor would be upside down when they got back. So this is it with all the um, capsules attached on the outside. I was uh, lucky; I got the chance to go up this leg. 
and then you walked onto this platform. They've since put oh, hoops around this, but when I went up, they didn't. It was quite scary. You walked up that little ladder into the spindle, and then you can go, and you can actually stand in between the spindle and the hub because there are two uh, races of uh, roll, uh, ball bearings where each ball is about this size. And this is one of the most inspected rides that you'll find. So every year they take it out of service for a couple of weeks in January, check everything over. And you can also get out here and look at the end fittings of the cables. Oh, this is uh, us on one of our office outings. But you see how fantastic it is that you can be right at the top and look out. And, and then another project. So this is now with um, my own practice, Jane Wernick Associates. This is um, Kew, uh, Kew Gardens, fantastic botanical gardens in London. And there's a brilliant um, arboriculturalist there called Tony Kirkham. And he had had a temporary um, walkway built out of scaffolding, in fact, through the redwoods. And it was so popular that he decided that the Kew should have a permanent one. And so he... Um, he found um, sponsors for this, and, um, and Mark Sparfield were on the framework agreement, and they luckily were able to persuade Q that I should be their engineer. So um, Julia and I walked around this, this site here, which is some woods that originally laid out by Capability Brown, although you wouldn't know that now, near the Temperate House. And then this, the stables yard, that's where all the tree surgeons are based. And we were walking around discussing what this walkway should be like. And it shouldn't be um, something to compete visually with the trees. I mean, the trees were the main show. And of course, in the building of it, we shouldn't kill the trees as well. That was pretty important. Um, and also we discussed what it should be made of. So um, we could have gone for timber, but timber is much less strong than steel. And so that it would have been quite massive elements. He, he was pretty sure that the walkway should be 18 metres above ground. So <clears throat> we said, let's do it out of steel. And then the issue is, what colour would you paint steel so it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb? And so I suggested weathering steel because it kind of just mellows. And Tony was immediately happy with it. And that sparked a whole series of happy, I think, design decisions because you can't buy rolled sections in weathering steel. And if we had been able to, I am sure that the quantity surveyor, that's like the cost account, costing chap, would have said we would have to have used circular hollow sections for the, for the towers. And that would have been very sad because you wouldn't have been able to afford to have rolled tapered sections. So anyway, we looked at lots of options for, we kind of quickly said, right, let's just have something that's repeatable and let's have pylon supports at regular spacings. And um, at this stage, we were thinking um, that we would have passing nodes of four metres and that we would have the trusses spanning 12 metres. In fact, in the end, we made this just three metres. And we looked at different ways of, of spanning. So we said, let, let the sides of the walkway be trusses that would span between them and let the floor be horizontal trusses to carry the wind. And a truss is basically a top cord and a bottom cord in, ten, in compression and tension and a series of diagonals. The diagonals don't have to be on any particular regular spacing. Um, they just have to be able to take the shear to the end support. And maybe we should have had the diagonals very close together so that they would serve as the balustrade, you know, that you mustn't have an opening of more than 100 millimetres. But then it looked quite dense. Um, so in the end, we said, well, let's come go for a more regular open arrangement for the diagonals. And then the architects said, let's put a mesh between them so kids could look out through it. <clears throat> and then, of course, architects love the Fibonacci sequence. It appears in nature all over the place. And I was scratching my head, how could we <laughs> incorporate this idea? So um, what we did was we said, right, let the intersection of, of the diagonals with the, with the cords follow the Fibonacci sequence. And because the shear is greatest at the ends, we'll have this close spacing be at the support. And at the middle, it can be much wider. And we'll come up with a pattern, and then we'll reverse it for the other half. Now, we could have joined all of those dots, but then that would have been too many diagonals. So the way we got this arrangement I tell you now, Julia and I sat down over with a piece of paper. I said, let's never have more than three uh, diagonals meeting at a point. 
and we just joined the dots till we thought we liked the pattern. And uh, that's what you see now. And then, then there's the pylon itself. So as I said, we knew that we had to make the pylon out of plate, which meant that we could make it tapered. And of course, the pylon is carrying compression from the loads and also bending. So one of the main things was that it, it's good for it to be a closed section so that it would have better buckling resistance. And if you're making it out of plate, then actually the triangle is the most stable shape for it to be. And I also really like triangular sections because you see the corner more than you see the side. So it tends to look smaller, I think, than a circular section looks. And then because it was triangular, then it was split into three branches to support what in the end became a circular passing node at the top. So this was the design that was submitted by planning. This is the architect's drawing. And there you can see the, the flipped sections. So there was a lot of repetition in it, which was helpful as well for cost. And we also, we, we experimented with, you know, what should the proportions of this column be? And of course, uh, deflections, lateral deflections do matter. So um, we, we said, right, we'll, we'll go for the conventional uh, under maximum loads of the deflection at the top being the height over 180. So it's a 100 millimeter deflection under extreme horizontal loads at the top. We also subsequently did, um, with the help of our WDI, Animos do na um, a natural, we did natural frequency analysis, and then they did a response analysis to make sure that we weren't going to get kind of wobbly bridge syndrome. The other big issue was about the foundations. So trees, I'm sure you know this, but there's the trunk, and then there's radial roots that provide stability. And then there's a whole mess of fibrous roots that gather water and nutrients. And all of that sort of occurs in the top meter of the soil. So Tony would be happy if we did a survey to see where the radial roots were. And then we could put our piles between the main roots. And if you've got a cantilever, you really want to have a minimum of four piles. So that whatever direction the wind is blowing in, you've got two in tension and two in compression. And you have to connect those piles together and then connect the base of the pile onto it. And normally, we would just have a one metre thick concrete pile cap. But if we put that in underground, we'd wipe out all of those roots. And Tony was not at all happy about that, and we wouldn't have been happy either. And the architects weren't happy with the pile cap being above ground. So this is a, pile, uh, um, a plywood mock-up of what the pile cap would have looked like above ground. So this was a crunchy moment. So we said, well, let's connect the tops of the piles instead with um, smaller steel sections. So they're just um, 450, damn, so that's what, one foot, what's that, so one foot six um, big elements. And each one, each, each, each um, pylon would have its own arrangement of piles to reflect where the actual roots were. So. During, excavation, during construction, we would wipe out the fibrous roots, but the main radial roots would be okay. And then gradually, the fibrous roots would grow back. Now, this project also had a brilliant um, um, chap called Tony Ma David Marriott. This, that's him, who worked for the company that did the steel fabrication. So we, we worked closely with him. In fact, we persuaded the client that we should get fabricator involved well, and contractor involved before we went out to final tender so that we were making sure we were designed something that everyone thought we could build and but we did have a discussion with David about so if you've got a triangle and you want to make three branches from it you can either as in this case fold out the flat side or you can fold out the vertices and I wasn't really happy with this because it, it looked quite clunky and I insisted on this, where it's the vertices that, that fold out. So, you know, we did have the luxury of making mock-ups of these to prove it. And then here's, oh, I'm going to skip through these now quickly. This is, this is on, on, on site. So you can see, and the piles, they've, they've just got steel sections plunged into them. Um, there's an isolator between the weathering steel and this painted normal steel. So this is the steel grillage. There's a lightning copper strip here. 
and then the, this is it being lifted up. I, mean, I think it looked fantastic actually before we put the walkway on it. <laughs> but, um, and then this is the, the walkway going on. Um, so either end of each bridge section we have stainless steel pins and at one end there's a slotted hole. And this is the mesh. They've since pruned back the foliage a bit so you can't climb out onto the trees. This is the opening. That's Tony Kirkham, the Duchess of Kent. And kids love it because they can just look down. So, and parents like it because they're not worried that the kids are going to be climbing over. And halfway through, there's a bigger kind of what's called the teaching node. can have like 30 kids on it. And that's the uh, steel. And actually, Tony's planted some redwoods in this bit because it's quite similar. And then this is another project with David and Julia. This is in um, in Bahrain, and it's um, we're not we weren't actually involved in the building. This is a children's hospice, and the client is is the Ministry of Health. And it happens that the wife of the Minister of Health is is a, actually a Scottish woman, and she was. Um, very keen on this project. She was the champion for the project. And we got involved with David and Julia on a walkway that climbs up over the buildings and with these bridges. And then you end up and there's a lift that you can take down and also a little Ferris wheel. And all of this is wheelchair accessible. And this is just one of our early concept drawings. So the walkway is this kind of... Um, sinusoidal type arch structure that supports this walkway that climbs up over it and then there's a canopy above it because obviously you've got to have shading so this is that all put, put together and this is it completed and it, it, it's it's really nice oh and I've got another triangular cross-section arch here this is a long span structure with a tie and the floors hanging from it and this mesh is rather nice. It's, per it's just perforated metal. But these, these are um, uh, characters from a, from a children's book. And then they, here's the little Ferris wheel. And each capsule is big enough for two wheelchairs and two carers. This is it on the top of the roof. So a playful structure. And that, this is Margaret Elsa, the client. So, and um, again, the steel fabricator was Wagner Bureau, an Austrian firm. And she, she made it possible that we could use a European firm that we could work with very closely. And this, the, it was, the steel was made in Dubai. So again, it's a project that relied on collaboration. And definitely this is about bringing to light. So another person I've collaborated with quite a bit is David Chipperfield. And just before I left Arabs, I worked with him on a, this competition for the Venice Cemetery Island, San Michele. Um, and so the, the cemetery, obviously, it, it, it's problematic because the, it, it's, it's a finite area. All, all the bodies and bones have to be above ground because of the water. And um, generally, your coffins are put into a kind of bookcase. And then after 10 years, your bones are taken out and put into smaller boxes. And then eventually, depending on how wealthy you are, into a ossarium. Um, so this project was to be in two bits. Firstly, to just build a, the first phase, which would be this bit. Then to infill a bit more and make this last bit here. And then finally, to make a whole new island. So the original line has got a, a, a brick wall all the way around it, and it's a very kind of insular, closed-in space. This, when it eventually gets built, will be stepping down to the water, so we'll have a different feel. And uh, we collaborated with um, local Venetian engineers. So I was quite lucky when I left Arabs. I was able, because um, David asked me to collaborate with him and he was working on projects abroad, he was also collaborating with local architects, so I was able to be involved in projects that... If they'd been in the UK, our practice wouldn't have been large enough to do, probably. So this is the original, this is the existing, and this is the plan. So the, the design is that, the, that it's all laid out like cloisters, 
and sun is an issue. So there, it's re it's all reinforced concrete, but uh, with shading structures above. Um, this is a cross section through it. So, so this is what this is where the coffin goes in. This is concrete, and then there's columns in front. So like a colonnade with a little concrete roof above, and um, and then these are these piles go down um, through the soft kind of mud, and there is clay at depth and. So the local engineers designed all the foundations, but it's like an elephant's foot, really. They kind of dig down a hole and then they, they let the bottom of the casing go and pump concrete in, and it makes like a pad that spreads the load on a wider area. This is it, the first bit of it finished. I mean, it's quite a strange place with all these plastic flowers and photos and everything. And then uh, another project with Dave is um, this is um, the studio for Anthony Gormley, and I just saw your new uh, installation that you've got of his, which just looks fantastic. So um, this is uh, north of King's Cross, and um, I think this is quite an interesting building, and in superficially it looks really simple and straightforward. So it's just a series of, of, of zigzag roofs, you know, like very industrial. Um, the middle three bays are double height, and then the end ones, there's, there's a floor at first floor level. Um, and, so, and also in, in the double height space along both sides, there are crane rails. And then just notice here, this column can't go down to the ground because there's a big window underneath it. Um, and I think with David, it's, it's complete opposite of working with David and Julia. That with them, they really want to express how the structure is working. And here, the structure is completely hidden. And it was important that the inside walls and the outside walls were both perfectly flat. So the structure is hidden behind. So here's the crane rail. Um, and then here's um, you know, all kind of rather bog standard sort of steel. But these columns are working much harder than these columns because they're double height and they've got a crane rail loading them on one side. So the thickness of the walls was actually governed by the size of, of these columns. So that's... Um, the crane rail there. This is the double height space. There's the crane. And then these, um, so, so behind here, obviously, there's a transfer beam. And then here, we've got cantilever beams supporting this very big outside platform for these stairs. And there's trusses buried in, in the sides of the stairs. So that um, when, when you look this way, it's just, these are just two parallel trusses just joined together by the treads. So it's a completely different way of working. Um, now I want to say a bit about Zaha, who I, Zaha Hadid, who you know died on the 30th of March. And um, I met her because um, she had, when, uh, shortly after she won the peak competition, she was collaborating with someone called David Tomlinson at Arabs, who then decided to give up engineering and go into accountancy or something, I'm not sure what. And she was livid. Um, and um, she, um, she was introduced to Peter Rice, who, who gave her time. And um, he said to me, I should work with her. So I was never in his group, but from time to time, he would just give me a call and say, I think you should work on this project. So this, this project was in Dusseldorf, so beside, beside the river, which has a very wide tidal range. And this is her study model of it. So. Um, the river's on this side, and it's basically a coll co collection of finger buildings that house hotel, offices, etc. And then the ground plane is distorted to let people in to below ground, A, to a shopping centre, and then also to car parking below. And, I mean, one of the critical things was, of course, that if, you, if you're building a basement in an area where the water table can be much higher, there's a risk that the whole thing can float up like a boat. So we did have to have a very thick concrete base underneath to hold it all down because the buildings are not covering the whole area. And notice these finger buildings here that are kind of appearing to float or cantilever out a long way. Uh, I mean, one of the things I think about Zaha's work it was that you could get kind of sidetracked by the funny shapes, let's say, but actually, if you looked at them carefully, they were always about urban context about bringing people into the projects. Um, they were for human beings. 
and uh, I think that she was really good at, at her analysis of the site and how projects should fit into them. Um, so this is further study models and we needed to find ways to communicate with her. I hadn't worked with her before, as I said. Um, we kind of came up with ways of having sort of rules because she would work with the models and then if you change something you know we couldn't just reanalyze the whole structure so instead we sort of said if you're going to have um, um, a, 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 a cantilever of a certain size then this is the, the depth of slab you need so just kind of work within those rules and then you can put the columns where you like um, uh, and the, and if, if you go further apart than that then you'll then you'll need Beams. So we'd give kind of these kind of it's more like a design guide almost, and then they would do a study of what it might look like and see whether it worked. Um, and I always say I I was a house analog engineer, so this is pre um, digital and all doubly curved. Um, and of course there was a lot of discussion about how to get the effect of this this one building cantilevering out a long way. Should we put a big transfer truss at the top and hang it? What other ways could we use? And then, in fact, uh, I was in a meeting with Peter and her, and I said, well, what about a kind of perforated wall, like a deep Virendil? So this always became known as the Virendil building, which then became part of the architectural study models. I mean, we also said that columns um, didn't have to be on a regular grid and they didn't have to be vertical, but it'd be good if they were continuous from ground to roof. Um, and then, of course, we, well, I should have said that project didn't get built, um, sadly, and Geary actually somehow got the project off her. <laughs> um, and then we worked with her on the Cardiff Opera House scheme. And, um, you know, I'll never forget the day when I got this phone call in the office and, it's all, we've won! <laughs> you know, it was just out of the blue because it had been a completely open competition for the first stage and then they would select four other architects for the second stage and she was in the open. She wasn't one of the four selected. So it was fantastic. And we, um, and it was um, studies like this. Um, and the, um, the idea was, well, firstly, again, about the urban response. So this is the kind of the roof plan. And the idea was of, to have the auditorium and then this kind of necklace that would be lifted above ground and contain rehearsal spaces. The, actually, the, the fly tower was concealed within this back bit, so you didn't even stick up like an obvious fly tower. And as a result, people could then, um, oh, this is the raised ground plan, they could walk in underneath the, this, the, these wings above and walk around and they would be able to hear people rehearsing in the spaces above. And also the people who worked there during the daytime, they would all have windows, whereas all the other entries were like great big monolithic edifices where most people just would never see the light of day. Um, so this, this was study models of this kind of the idea of the, the necklace folding round, wrapping around the auditorium. Um, endless study models. And people immediately said it all terribly expensive. But notice, th these are models made out of card and paper and perspex. So nothing can have more than single curvature. So the cladding wouldn't have been ridiculously expensive. And in those days, it was all line drawings and then models. The un an unusual thing was the auditorium was not symmetrical, but there was a kind of center where you could um, put your eye. And these are all the study models of the auditorium. And then we, well, there was a whole shenanigans and they tried, there was sexism and racism they tr and they tried to have a second competition which she also won. And then they said, well, you can't, you know, it, it's too expensive. So we showed how you, it's actually, it was just very, very simple structure. Just, you know, okay, things might be inclined at different angles, but it's, none of this is rocket science. It was all straightforward trusses and columns and slabs. So it was terribly sad that 
Cardiff didn't get this. But I think it would have been amazing. And then, um, well, with my own uh, practice, I worked on this ski jump with her. Again, this is made out of plastic that's wrapped around, so it's single curvature. Um, actually, at the competition entry, we had, we had these um, additional columns, so this could stay very, very thin. And I was pretty upset because the local architect, uh, engineer, put in a really ugly cable truss underneath this and didn't have those columns. But, uh, so I won't dwell on it too much. <laughs> And then this, this, is, this is the only, this was her first building in, in the UK. Um, it's a Maggie Centre. So Charles Jenks' wife, Maggie, who died of cancer, the, the idea was to have small buildings on a hospital campus where you could go, not, not for treatment, but just to see a counsellor, sit with your family, have a cup of tea, whatever. There'd be a meditation room. And um, so this one is in Kokordi. And the, the leftover site on the campus is this kind of gulch, uh, ugly tall building there and a car park here. So Zaha's design sort of turns its back on, on the car park, tries to lean out over the edge. Um, so, but the pile, so it's piled back here so that this can just cantilever out. So notice again, this is made out of flat sheets folded around. And yes, the side walls are inclined a lot, but, but it's still quite straightforward. Uh, except that the site we were given, there was, um, a water outflow here and a sewer here that we had to miss with our piles. So we had to try and have straightforward ground beams. Um, again, this is a model without the roof on it. So inside, there are no straight walls in this direction. So stability in this direction was easy. We could use the side trusses. But in this direction, we buried some columns in these curved walls and put a beam on the top to give um, portal frames in that direction. So this is a plan. This is a plan on a truss, so it's leaning out quite a lot. Uh, and then our columns are, are on these lines. Um, this is elevation on the trusses. This is it on site. And then this is the opening day. So, and it's, so it's looking out over the gulch. And this is Zaha with Gordon Brown uh, enjoying the opening. So um, now I'm going to talk about a theatre in London. This is the Young Vic Theatre. And again, this, this was a theatre that was built on a site that had been bombed during the war. And they uh, built this as a temporary theatre now, more than 40 years ago. And um, it was um, a single layer of block work with a kind of exoskeleton. So very bad thermally, very bad acoustically, but it was to bring theatre to young people in the area and very, very popular and run by a brilliant director, David Lann, uh, for the last, ooh, I don't know, 15 years. So the idea was to, and, and it was a competition, and we went in with um, Howard Tompkins. And the idea was to, so this is the original size of the auditorium, was to wrap it with a new skin, put in trusses over the top so you could actually fly stuff over it. Um, and also this space would provide get round so you could walk all the way around the auditorium and that could be used uh, during the performance. And this is a plan of um, the existing auditorium. We decided to keep the bottom half of it so the um, sequence, which always was that you'd go through this butcher's shop and then turn right to go into the auditorium. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which was the only bit that had been left standing after the war. Um, and then you'd go to this theatre in the round. That would stay the same, but it would be built up taller. Here are these get rounds. This part of the site would be, would, would be filled with a kind of back-of-house space, but we put a great big hole in the wall here. So this could be a kind of proscenium arch for some shows. And then this whole area here was just rebuilt. Uh, well, the, the butcher shop, we saved the walls and the roof. We had to put in new floors because of the loadings, etc. And then this is um, that there's a small auditorium here and here, and the rest of it is all back of house. But it's a, um, and the other thing was we were coming up close to the edge of the road, so we couldn't put piles in along. This is in front of the auditorium, so we had to put piles in at either end, put in a new truss, and hang that facade on the street. 
So this is a uh, ground floor pan, and the, so the only bit that it was original were these walls and the concrete raft that it was on, and these walls, and the rest of it is all new. And so the original bit was just built on a thin concrete raft put on top of the ground, which was a mixture of kind of rubble and all sorts of things. So it had rotated slightly. So we decided to just use the walls for lateral stability, but not put any more vertical load on it. And all the new vertical loads are going onto piles, which connected with ground beams, and then a reinforced concrete slab. So this is a section through the auditorium, the existing raft. These are pairs of trusses, so people can walk between them, and they support cross beams. And hanging from the new roof, we're actually supporting a new gallery at high level. And then this is, this is the bit which is hanging over the sidewalk at the front. Um, yeah. And this is the section the other way. And these, these trusses are like that, so that at the edge you can get underneath them. This is the existing butcher's shop. And then here's the double height space. It'll be clear when I show you a photo of that. And here's the plan on all that steel work in the roof. And here's, this is where the big hole is going to be. So all the existing seats and galleries had to be removable there so that you'd be able to look through it. So this, that's that big hole I was talking about. And this is all the new steel work that was put in around the existing um, walls. This is it on site. So this is the, the truss above the big new opening. This is, these are the pairs of trusses. And we've got these elements. These are rectangular hollow sections deliberately with a thin dimension in the vertical plane. So it gives a bit more headroom for the technicians to walk underneath. And we've got bearings here. It's kind of industrial engineering, I think, this bit. This is the auditorium. So these seats are just copies of what, what the original ones were. It's unnumbered seats mostly. And then this is the first level of gallery. And there's a bit around here that's removable. And then the, well, you can't really see the higher bit that's hanging. And then this is the, one of the smaller spaces. So it was a very tight budget. So all the finishes are exposed. Uh, but it's, it works well. These, the concrete's got those unistruts cast into it so you can attach things to it. So the theatre is a real machine. And this is a fantastic double height foyer space that's open all through the day. People meet here. It's open, I think, from 8 in the morning. Up here is, is an outside balcony that looks out over the street that's called The Cut. So it's really been part of the regeneration of this, this road. And you can see here, because there's no finishes, it meant we could have fun with having very clean detailing for our connections. And this, well, this is, this is that outside balcony looking out over the cut, and that's the new cladding of the auditorium. So it's been very successful. Now, I've been involved in a series of houses called Living Architecture. So Alain de Botton um, had the idea, how come the British public doesn't want to buy modern houses? Whereas in the States, people want modern houses. On the continent, people want modern houses. And he said, well, maybe it's because they don't... The only modern architecture they experience is um, civic architecture. Whereas if, if we built some holiday homes, they could go and stay in them and appreciate how wonderful it is to stay in a well-designed modern house. So he's commissioned a series of very good architects to design these, these buildings. And they're fantastically popular, and we've been lucky to be doing the engineering on them. So this one uh, was designed by MVRDV, a Dutch firm, uh, and it's called The Balancing Barn. So it, oh, I didn't mean to do that, sorry. It's, um, it cantilevers out over the ground. And basically, this is just a cantilever tube, and it's weighted down at this end. Here, we didn't need to have a diagonal because we've got this one carrying us through. So this could be a big square window. And similarly, this uh, at the back, we could take the, the forces down through those diagonals. This is just our structural drawing. This is it on site. Now, one thing is, though, that obviously a cantilever is going to deflect at the end, and we worried about natural frequency and vibration. If you're sitting in that living room at the end, is it going to be really irritating when people walk by? And when we did our first analysis, it was kind of borderline. I mean, this is very subjective, whether you get bothered by deflections. 
So um, we agreed that we would, we would have a potential design of some dampers to put in, but we did know that once all the cladding was attached that this would, this would act to dampen it down. So basically what happened was that they built this, it was pretty lively, and then when they put all the cladding on, Alan went and jumped up and down. He said, no, it's okay. <laughs> and um, the, um, there's a kind of a visual joke that all the steel is wrapped in timber, so you, it looks like a timber truss, but it isn't. <laughs> and this is typical, I think, of the Dutch architects. I just think they're very playful about these sorts of things. And it's wrapped in this um, shiny metal. And it's got this kind of amazing door here. It's a bit like um, Thunderbirds. It's open with um, <laughs> hydraulics. <laughs> and it's covered in this stone. So you can get into the house, well, more. You can get out of the house down here. There's a utility room under there. And there's a swing hanging below. <laughs> Another one we're working on, we've been working on already for about five years, and maybe finish in two years' time, is with Peter Zumtor. And it's in Devon, and so this is in his office, one of the workshops. And the idea of it is a bit influenced by Stonehenge, standing stone, supporting great big slabs. Um, now, um, and his idea is that the vertical elements are rammed concrete, so that's unreinforced concrete that's just laid in layers and tamped down. Um, so it's a bit like rammed earth, really, but it's concrete instead. Uh, but he wants that inside and outside, and he wants the roofs to be concrete inside and outside, and he wants the glazing to be set back from the edge of the roofs. So, as you know now, we have to worry about um, cold bridging. So it's basically everywhere two layers of concrete with insulation between. And for the roofs, because the, the ceiling inside must line up with the ceiling outside, it means that the top bit of concrete has to go down and be like that. So there's a lot of concrete in this project. This is a plan. There's a big living room here. So that's the edge of the roof, this thin line. And then the shaded area is the edge of the glazing. And so you can see this big cantilever here. So we have got an external support here. We're not allowed to use the mullions to support the roof, unfortunately. And then these red bits are round concrete. Where you see red, that means it's warm concrete. And where you see blue, it's cold concrete. So these are the bedroom wings. This is an earlier version, actually, so we don't have this separate building anymore. And this, so this is Kate Perver, who works for us, does these great sketches. But this is showing the support positions and sort of... So you can see that's a very big cantilever and that's a big cantilever. And these are, this is the issue of the bottom of, of the ceiling has to line up with the bottom of the concrete there. So that has to be the same thickness as that, plus the insulation, plus, uh, um, plus the thickness you need for the root of this cantilever. So it ends up being about a metre thick in places. And then this is the two layers of rammed concrete. So we were worrying about how we could analyse that big roof of one layer of concrete sitting on top of another, because obviously the two layers have got... This, if this is the supports, and that we've got insulation in between the two, which acts as kind of springs between the two layers, how, how are we going to work out what's going on with the shape of the top one in relation to the shape of the bottom one? So in the end, we set up um, a model... Whoops where we actually represented the bottom layer, oh, sorry, the bottom layer with plate elements and the top layer with plate elements and then the, these springs in between the two that have the stiffness characteristics of the insulation. And we had to have thicker insulation at the kind of the bearing points. So there's different stiffnesses of insulation in the model because the stresses are much higher around here. It's very exaggerated deflected shape, don't worry. But we did have to check the deflection so that the deflections above where the glazing line is can't be more than 20 millimetres. And you, with concrete, concrete creeps, so you get your instantaneous deflection and, and you get deflection as response to loads, but then also with time it just sags more and more. So we've had to tr try and estimate all of that. And in fact, 
we've said that it, the, the glazing should be measured once the concrete's been there for six months so that we'll have got rid of the majority of the creep. No, it's just another plan. So this, I'll just show some shots on site. This is it being rammed. This is, there's massive scaffolding to support the concrete. So they're, they're, they've pretty well made the wings and they're in the process now of making the main roof. Okay, this is uh, the last project. This, I'm only showing one project as a collaboration with this architect, Peter, Peter Beard of Landrum. But in a way, he's my favourite architect to work with. Um, and I met him at first when he was teaching at Cambridge and I was working with his unit and then he was at the AA. And he, he's always had a tiny practice at the moment. He's just working on his own. But this project was um, re really interesting. So this, this, is the village, this is the village of Raynham, which is to the east of London. And there's, um, there's a, a small train line, or a normal train line, and then there's High Speed 1, the fast train line that comes out here. And this, so these two train lines have really severed Raynham from the River Thames, which is over here. And so um, we were asked to look at options. There's a very ugly footbridge that goes over <laughs> High Speed 1 here. Look at options for getting from the top of that footbridge down into this area of the marshes, which is a uh, site of spe specific scientific interest. So that's that. Um, there, is, there, is this, there is this ramp that just goes back and forth on itself, but we can attach to this... Now notice there's there's a water gully here. Um, so the idea was to have a long straight walkway that would just go from that top point down to the marshes. And um, when I was out, so I had actually worked with Max Scoggin and Meryl Elam on a scheme for the for Atlanta uh, during the Olympics that didn't get built called Atlanta Pavilion. And this was a kind of timber space frame that was all squiffy shapes, supported by timber columns that were at different angles. Uh, they were cruciform columns, as it happens. And the structural idea that, that they were happy to go along with was that if you have all the columns at different angles, and if the roof has got bending stiffness in and out of plane, then actually it is stable. And so I, and it didn't happen, so I always wanted to try this out. So I said to Peter, could we try it? And also, because of the setting, we were both quite interested in exploring the use of timber. So uh, the columns are timber, and each you can see, and they're supporting a steel ladder. So the cross beams are every three meters, and every beam is supported by one column at either one end or the other. And every column, if you can imagine, is off, off the vertical, if it's going at 15 degrees, there would be four positions that it could be in. And we would choose one of the positions for each column. There are a couple of exceptions. There's, there's a road and a water course that we had to go over. So that in those instances, the deck had to span a bit further. So that, that is what determined the size of the edge beams. Uh, so this is the plan showing the four positions. Each column could be either there, 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 or there. And we actually found that changing which of those positions uh, the bottom of the column was at affected the natural frequency of the whole because that was really what we were worrying about the most. <clears throat> here's uh, his study model of it. So, and the idea was also that we would use as natural timber as possible. So they, they are pretty well tree trunks that, are, trunks that have had the bark taken off. So they're bigger at the bottom than at the top. Roughly about 650 at the bottom, tapering to 450-ish at the top. Um, and this, well, again, this planning drawing, a bit reminiscent of the Q one. Um, so this column could be in any of those positions. And you just walk along this deck and look out. And this, this drawing sort of shows this top surface is the walkway. Then this is showing the columns but, and the things that we had to go over. And then this is the elevation on it. 
but this drawing is showing all the obstacles that are in the ground. It was a nightmare. We didn't know about this when we started. I blithely had thought that we could have a nice, continuous kind of pile cap beam that would connect the feet all together. And the real wrinkle was that all of these grey zones are zones where we weren't allowed to put piles. So you can see that little triangle is a pile cap. Here we've got a more reasonable pile cap for that area. Um, and then over here we've got little bits of pile cap. So it turned out to be much more of a worry and we had to analyse um, the piles themselves and the stiffness of them being restrained by the ground when we were trying to work out whether the structure was going to be stiff enough. So this is, this is a deflection analysis under different load cases and we wanted to make sure that, again, it, it, was, it was that this number, height, height over, over deflection, was more than 180. That wasn't too difficult to achieve, but we, um, and similarly at this uh, different load case, at this end it was the worst, but that was okay. But then we had to get the natural frequency to be above 1.3 hertz. And this was the lesson learned from the Millennium Footbridge that by and large when people all walk, that's the frequency that you walk at. So if you're going, you could set it off if you're below 1.3 hertz. Above you are pretty safe. <clears throat> and then this, this is one of our details for, again, we were using one of these spherical bearings. So this is a tip from the Parc de la Villette. So that we, we wanted the bottom of the columns to be as pure pins as possible. We didn't want to put bending into the timber. And we actually used the same chap, Peter Bircher, who had actually made, because the Atlanta Pavilion, it was terribly sad, they actually fabricated all of it. Um, and Peter Bircher had developed, he, he had de he's a German entrepreneur, and he's developed a kind of timber equivalent of the steel marrow space frame. And for that, he, he had developed these um, kind of steel, cast steel rods that get set into the timber and then there are cross dowels. So it can take tension as well as compression, which we needed to be able to do. So this is one of his drawings. And then this is one of Peter's. Because it's going over a road, it all has to be inspected, all sorts of extra criteria. So there's a, there's a mesh underneath that has to be able to fold down. That's what this drawing is about. This is a detail at the edge of the walkway with this. This is to shed water off the walkway. This is a very thin pile cap that we squeezed in between that little water gully and this is that ugly footbridge. This is the, support, the, the scaffolding, for, oops, scaffolding for during construction. Is it? So the um, the deck is composite with the with these cross beams, and then this is it, kind of pretty well complete. So it's got this kind of weird, um, quirky feel to it. But I'm I'm very pleased with this project. It was. Uh, Really good. And another, there's another project with a brilliant client um, at the London Bar of Havering who's a real champion for it. So, that's, and now I'm going to just end with this last slide, full circle, back to mindfulness. Um, for the last uh, four years, I've been very privileged to um, sing with this director, Philip Thorby, a real specialist in Renaissance music in Venice. So this is the Church of Santa Croce in, in Venice. And uh, oops. Uh, what I think about um, singing in such an ensemble, that too is all about collaboration and happiness. Um, so I end on that cheery note. It's an absolutely incredible body of work, and you can see why we're so honored to have Jane here for the 10th Goldstein Lecture. It is getting late, but I think we could have just one or two uh, quick questions if anyone has a question or clarification, and we always love questions from students. Especially female ones. Because <laughs> I know it's really hard to ask a question. It's more difficult than giving a talk, <laughs> and the only way to get better at it is to try. <laughs> The, the 
concrete structure. Did you take into consideration how it was going to sound inside? Like the audio was. You talk about what this, the Zoom tour house. Yes. Um, me personally, no. I mean, it has been discussed. I mean, the bedrooms are quite small anyway, and the, the large room. I mean, it's not massive. I mean, it's not bigger. It's much, much smaller than this. I mean, it's half the size of this. So I, I think Peter just said it's not a problem. <laughs> and if it is, they'll put more coal bits in. And, also, and of course, people aren't ever there for more than a week. But it's, it's a good point. It has been raised. Well, I just have to say the diversity of the work and the and what you bring to the projects in terms of creativity and fresh thinking every time is a real inspiration for, for our students and for all of us. So thank you so much. And the last thing I have to share is that Jane will be back in the States in three weeks to give a talk at MoMA in New York on Japanese engineers and their collaborations with Japanese architects as part of the exhibition at MoMA on Japanese architecture right now. And so um, we're thrilled that uh, we'll welcome her back to the States where I forgot to mention she taught at the GSD 27 years ago <laughs> and is pleased to be back in Cambridge. So we're thrilled to have you, Jane, and we hope to see you here again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.